Hello, everyone. Welcome to Conceptualism. I'm very happy to have with me here Tristan Zaba, who is uh, an eccentric composer, poet, philosopher, musician, and general bad boy. Oh, wow. What yes. an introduction. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes, I have done my research, you see. <laughs> yes, I, I read I read on your website that you like intertextual references and, and, and from all those from, from from all those things we can draw lots of intertextual references. No. <laughs> yeah, I do like those. Well, I'd like to start by by asking you um about uh you know what matters to you in music. You know, what 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 are you trying to achieve? I would say uh you know at its core, I'm trying to achieve some sort of uh, communication and some sort of uh, relationship with mm -hmm. uh, other people who are involved, whether, you know, audience members or, you know, fellow musicians who mm -hmm. are involved with a piece. But I think it's, uh, I mean, really, I, for me, my music is about uh, connection. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, and, and so, so then how, how do you achieve connection? How do you achieve these connections with people? You know, um, it, like, is it an emotional connection? Is it an intellectual connection? What, what, you know, and, and, and what are the, what are the methods that, that you use to connect? Well, I mean, the methods are sort of, uh, that's a very large question, but I think really it has to do with, uh, it has to do with strong intention yes. a lot of the time. Mm. It has to do with, uh, it has to do with having not necessarily something literal. I, uh, you know, want to say like, you know, I'm going downstairs. That's a lit <laughs> literal thing I could say that I probably wouldn't say by writing a string quartet, but it's, uh, <laughs> It's, uh, but I mean, yeah, for, for me, it's, it's something to do with expression, uh, and however amorphous that may be in an abstract art form. And it's, uh, and yeah, I think on some level, if you have a strong intention, things can carry in ways to, uh, other people through, what is truly sort of abstract art that uh you maybe can't fully rationalize all the time but yeah wonderful well well yes exactly and 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 i think having a vision and having strong intentions is really what distinguishes the boys from the men and the girls from the women <laughs> You know, I think, I think, I think knowing what you want is like half the battle. Yeah. Yeah. And also sort of, uh, uh, I think on some level also, uh, having a faith that, mm. uh, what you have to say is worth saying as yes. well. Yes. Yes. I, I agree. In fact, it's so it's so interesting because as artists, you know, we're you know we have so many insecurities, but but we do need we do need certain securities, and one of them is that what we're doing is worth it because otherwise why would you do it? Yeah, I I mean the way I think about that is sort of uh, I mean there are so many uh, egotistical uh, artists out there, and there sort of always have been from mm. like uh, you know. You know, Va Wagner to Kanye West, and it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's sort of, I don't know, on, there's a danger of going, I guess, too far down this uh, intellectual rabbit hole, but at the same time, you de do need to have a little bit of an ego to sort of uh, at least support the idea that what you're saying is important enough to, you know, uh, to, to be expect, listened to yeah to be listened to and to expect people to like 
pay to listen to. So. <laughs> yes, well, I, I don't think either of us have gone the Kanye West route, uh, thank God. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, really, I mean, being an artist, being a composer, being a conductor, I mean, these are, they do, they do require a certain amount of ego. You know, I mean, you, I mean, you do have to advocate for yourself. You have to believe that what you're, what you're doing, like you said, is worth paying for and, and, you know, and, and, and that the audience will come and sit and listen to your music for an hour and a half. I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a big ask. It's a big ask, but you know, if you think it's worth it, if you believe it's worth it, then, 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 you know, you can start to convince other people that it's worth it. Yeah, no. And it's, uh, and I think, yeah, for, uh, artists as well. Yeah. It's a strange line. You have to, uh, walk Mm. mentally between, uh, you know, sort of being humble and sort of viewing, continuing to view your art as really, uh, a relationship and allowing people into it and not necessarily having this sort of intense ownership of how you need to be able to control how it's going to be processed and you sort of need to be able to balance that with the fact that uh art on some sense is sort of an egotistical thing so it's sort of like you know you need to develop this like i don't know egoless ego i think to be a a healthy (laughs) artist and it's a it's a hard line to walk sometimes well, yes, it is. And, and, and it's, it's a paradox. But then again, you know, a career in the arts is also a paradox. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah and speaking of paradoxes, I mean, you know, it's this idea that you have to be humble, uh, you know, but at the same time, you have to be a star. And it's like, it's like, what, is, what does that even mean? You know, like, like, how, how can you be a, a quote, a star conductor or a star architect? you know, but at the same time, be humble. Like what, you Stark know. Star architect. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, Frank Gehry f- hates that fucking word, but, but I think it's, it's apt. I mean, look at, look at Walt Disney Hall. I mean, look at, look at the, look at the pipe organ. I mean, if that isn't, you know, some guy wanking off and, you know, and, and, and <laughs> basically, you know, you know, stroking his ego, I don't know what is. I mean, like, you know, it's like, it's, it's obscene. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, but yet it makes perfect sense because he believed it made sense. You know? Yeah, no, it's sort of the same thing. Whenever I look at a uh, Casa Loma in it's... Toronto, I'm living in Toronto. It's like you look at it and it's like, <laughs> why is it there? What a ridiculous <laughs> thing to want to construct in Toronto, Ontario. And then at the same time, you know, there's sort of the the other side of it. It's like, well, you know, it's kind of cool, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they have a they have a theater organ in there that's that's never used. Yeah which is a shame. Uh, but I mean, look at, look at, for example, Drake, Drake, ha- you know, built a hundred million dollar mansion, you know, uh, in Toronto. Right. And, and while he was at it, I mean, he, I don't even know if he plays the piano, but he had, he had a custom Busendorfer built for himself that cost over a million dollars. Cause when you're Drake, I mean, you can just drop a million on a piano and it's nothing, you know, drop in the bucket, Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but see, this is what I'm saying, like being an artist, like it, it's so weird. Like, how do you walk the line between, you know, being humble and, 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 you know, I don't know, like you said, like there's this ego, less ego, you know, it's like, yeah. that's such a fascinating concept to me. I mean, that you could write a book about that. You could write a dissertation about that, you know, <laughs> you know, study, yeah. study, you know, what, what does it mean to be a creative? And the other thing is that culture has been commoditized, you know, it, it's like the whole neoliberal idea that, you know, culture is a commodity. I mean, it's, it's basically fucked with artists for, for a really long time now, almost 50 years, uh, because, you know, artists are no longer viewed as artisans, people that are creating things. I mean, now, now there's this insecurity, you know, of like, of, you know, you have to just, you have to work and then you have to, you have to accept whatever pay you're given and be grateful that you're being paid. You know, it's the whole thing is a it's it's very bizarre. It's a it's it's a contradict. It's it's just it's contradictions, you know, with with paradoxes on as, you know, icing on top. It's like the whole thing makes absolutely no sense. It's like, why? Why should Yo-Yo Ma get paid, uh, you know, a million dollars a concert, uh, you know, uh, and and, you know, I don't know, 
you know, every other cellist has to ex accept a $50 gig. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't know. Like what is Yo-Yo Ma that much better than, 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 I don't know, your, 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 your virtuoso cellist yeah. that, that's just I mean, come out of Juilliard. I mean, I don't know. No. Is it just his personality? Is it just the opportunities yeah. he's had? Like I ask these kinds of questions and it's like, what, what makes an artist worth what they're worth? Yeah. Well, I mean, like it's uh Yo-Yo Ma is, is pretty dang good. But it's yes, uh, he's brilliant. He is. Yeah. I, I'm just I'm using him as an yeah. example. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not no. trying to diss Yo-Yo Ma. I, I, <laughs> I love Yo-Yo Ma. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? Diss sacrilege. Yo -Yo. Yeah, sacrilege. I. I'm yes. <laughs> anyway, but uh, oh man, I may have uh, forgotten what I was actually about to say. Oh, I was gonna say yeah. It's uh, it's also networking, and I think it's yes. uh, well, people on the skills topic of networking there's also sort of uh there's the sort of as with people as social animals as you know and uh, i would say audience members are most of the time people there's uh <laughs> for, for musical expression it's uh it's sort of there's a little bit of the sort of mob mentality of like this guy likes someone therefore i like them and then it's just sort of you know this mass stampede of people who like yo-yo ma that uh sort of uh affects a lot of things in our culture yes yes well well have you ever played to an audience of robots uh no no i was thinking uh there's a you know uh laurie anderson i don't no? Oh, she's sort of, uh, she was at, uh, the 21C festival that the RCM did, uh, last year in, mm. uh, Toronto, but she's sort of, she's done sort of pop stuff ranging to, you know, sort of performance art avant-garde sort of stuff since about the 80s, and she had, uh, actually with Yo-Yo Ma, that's why I thought of it, she and Yo-Yo Ma, I think, at one point were, uh, planning on collaborating on, a concert of music uh designed specifically for an audience of dogs <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, the original idea was apparently uh in uh to be entirely in registers that only dogs can hear and it <laughs> And it was sort of, they quickly figured that this was not a good idea, first of all, because, you know, you can't just have a giant park full of dogs and if you're uh, without their owners. And if you're going to do that, then you also, like, you know, just because they can hear really high frequencies doesn't mean they like to hear them for an hour and a half. Yes. So... <laughs> Yes, we. I mean, uh, it would be a violation of animal rights in the same yeah. way. Yeah, in the same way as listening to you know uh, something at zero hertz for a very long time would be very, well, it would be a kind of torture, in fact, for a human being. Yeah. You know. Uh, yeah. No, it's it's fascinating. Uh, and of course, you know, then then there are frequencies that are that are you know uh, things like you know infrared frequencies and X ray frequencies. You know, and and. And what did those sound like? And and then of course you know you realize NASA has made a bunch of music that's you know that's based on all these frequencies that they've then transcribed into the you know into the human hearing range. Uh, but I mean it's it's so limited. I mean think about bats. You know they're using sounds to actually see. You know they're mapping out locations with sound. And and so it makes me think about sound as a space even. You know like a building. Mm -hmm. You know like like. Like, or, or like as a plant, you know, sound is a plant, you know, you plant the yeah. seed and then you watch it yeah. grow, you know, uh, and it has thorns, you know, and, and I don't know, yeah. I don't know, like sound can hurt you, you know, sound, oh, totally. sound can, sound can heal you sound. I mean, sound is in fact, uh, probably, I mean, the most powerful medium and also the most abstract, you know, it's the yeah. most difficult to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, you know, ties ties us all up in some uh philosophical knots every now and then so. <laughs> yes well 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 i mean well the quality of a philosopher i suppose is is the ability to untie those knots and make them somehow resemble some semblance of sanity or or at least uh pretend to that's right exactly <laughs> exactly 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 yes fake it until you make it Yes. Yes. So, so I, I'm either a really good philosopher 
or a quack, and I can't tell which. Yeah. <laughs> but as long as nobody else can tell either, then you're okay. <laughs> So I want to talk about where we first met. Uh, we met at, uh, at a music academy, a, a music camp, uh, Orford Music uh, in Quebec. Uh, and you were my roommate. You had I was. The, you, you had the unfortunate experience of being my roommate. No, it, it, was, it was great. <laughs> yeah, it was great getting to know you. And yeah, that was a, a very... Uh, a very special experience working with, uh, with Simon, Simon Bertrand. Yes, yeah. it was. It was. Uh, I I think the most quote worthy mm -hmm. thing he said is, "I don't have any answers. I only have questions." And if you and if you think yeah. you have the answers, then then I'm just going to give you more questions. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the that's the way to go. It is because because people that claim to know what the answers of you know uh, to, I I don't know. It's somehow suspicious. I I think it's I think it's much. It's much nicer to have questions. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, and I mean, there's also uh, you know, there's a real joy to mm. life that can be uh discovered when you're not looking at everything as something that you need to solve. <laughs> yes, reveling in the ambiguity of it all. Yes, the gray yeah, spaces. Oh, I, I I personally believe it's important. Yeah. I, I I would concur. I I agree with you 100%. Um yes and and uh you know um you gave me a CD of your work Mosaic Suite. I I think it's one of the few CDs I I actually physical CDs I I own, you know. Yeah, well, I'm stuck in the past, so <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, I listened to it in the car, and my and my mom was like, "This is very strange music." And I said, "Well, I know, but that's that's the appeal. That's that's the appeal, you know." Yeah, I've got I've got I've got the CD of Mosaic Suite, uh, an obscure composer from Nova Scotia, and Zakir Hussein, the tabla maestro. So, oh you know. man, Zakir Hussein is amazing, isn't he? Brilliant. Did Genius. you uh, did you hear him with the uh, oh with the RCM Orchestra last year when he was in Toronto? No, I, I, I didn't. Uh, Might have I, been the year before too. Mm, no, I, I don't think I don't think I did. But I, I actually, I, I met the guy in India. Mm -hmm. You know, um, at a student festival that my school was participating in. What's he? What's he like uh, on a personal level? He's very quirky, but also very grounded. You know, he'll 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 say the most bizarre things. You know, it's like. And you and you never can tell whether he's serious or just fucking with you. Like you just you can't tell, you can't no. tell. You know, and it's it's brilliant. Uh, and and I mean, he's actually. I mean, he he's friends of the family. Actually, uh, you know, we we my you know, I have I have a well an uncle uh, who knows all these great classical music you know geniuses, these maestros, and they've all come to his house and they've all hung out with him. So he's got pictures of Zakir, you know, hanging out with his kids in his backyard. It's 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 kind of surreal, actually. It's, it's very crazy. bizarre. It's nuts. It's just weird. And then he has a door in his house where you know he has all the artists that have come to his house to perform. He has them sign the door. Now yeah. I've never performed it. Well, actually, I have performed at his house. I I DJed at his house once. Uh, but he had me sign the door with all these like genius Indian maestros. And I was like, I was like, I don't even know if I belong on this door. And he's like, no, no, go ahead, sign the door. So oh, anyway, that's it, amazing. It's very strange. It's like very surreal, you know, that, that like that there's such a connection that these artists are human beings, you know, we put them on these pedestals because it's like they're, they're geniuses, you know, they're, they're just, they're brilliant, but they're just human beings. It's like at the end of the day, you know, they're just, you know, they, they just want to smoke a cigarette after the show or drink their coffee. You know I mean? It's like, it's kind of, it's, there's a, I don't know. There's a relatability. There's a basicness, you know, to, to being an artist as well as all the genius and intellectual and philosophical and, you know, and spiritual that there's also a very basic, you know, grounding or or i don't know you know is artists recognize artists is what i'm saying we can smell each other you know it's like and and when there's a bunch of artists you know they all seem to gravitate towards each other and eventually by the end of the night by the end of the party all the artists will be hanging out together how does that happen because they can yeah. smell each other yeah you know there's something yeah. there there's something there so yeah he, he i mean meeting him was surreal it was like it was it was like something out of a, a you know like a dream or something yeah, I didn't quite believe that it happened, you know. 
Yeah, the first time uh, I heard Zakir Hussein was I was in a. Uh, I was in Banff. I was. Oh. Uh, there was a. He was at the, because I'm I'm from Alberta yes. originally, and uh, I'm sort of I I'm from a small town sort of in between uh, Calgary and uh, Banff Canmore area, and I was at the uh, and I went to a concert uh, at the Banff festival for the arts and uh the there was a it was a jazz concert uh with featuring uh zakir hussein and uh you know a bunch of just crazy like sort of veteran jazz artists like uh wadada leo smith was there and uh i don't know a number a number of of other really great people that are uh you know i can't recall off the top of my head right heavy now. cats heavy cats. yeah heavy cats and uh it was just you know i went in sort of like not really knowing what was uh what it was gonna be like it was all sort of very amorphous and they didn't really have a set list and it was just sort of like okay well we're gonna <laughs> You know, we're, we've got these people and it was just sort of like, uh, and I just walk in and it was like the most insane thing I've ever seen. These, these guys probably played for like maybe three and a half, four hours just straight. It was, uh, it was absolutely unbelievable <laughs> and just it, transcendently good. And uh, and you realize the and, amount of stamina that they. T I mean, that's like. Oh man. And not just. Yeah. For the, I mean, not just for the artists. I mean, for the audience. Like, fuck, man, four hours. Like, you gotta yeah. sit there and listen for four hours. I mean, it's it's almost as hard. It's almost as hard as as playing. I mean, it's not. But it, you know what I mean? Like. Yeah. Because oh, that, that that music requires so yeah. much from you. It it requires you 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 know you have to engage with it. You can't yeah. just hear it. You have to you have to listen. It forces yeah. you to listen. And you then know? after the concert, they went. They all went to a club in Banff and continued playing. <laughs> Man, that's that reminds me of like like you know like the you know Art Tatum would play you know he'd play his gig whatever club it was at and then afterwards he'd go to an after hours club and then just play into the early hours of the dawn where they would you know they'd have cutting oh. contests you know where like like musician all you know and he art tatum always liked to play last you know so yeah. all these pianists all these genius pianists would come and play and then he would play last and just wipe the floor with all of them make them all look like amateurs and these oh. are the best these are the best pianists like i mean they're yeah. just like art art tatum was such a monster like oh. I mean, apparently Oscar Peterson, when he heard him, he he cried and 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 they wouldn't play the piano for two months. He just he was I I he just he he was so intimidated. He just mm -hmm. decided he couldn't play the piano anymore. I've got like a fifteen disc set of uh, Art Tatum live, uh, like recordings from live shows, and it's uh. Are you serious? Yeah, I mean, we've got to yeah. listen to this. We got to listen. Oh, to this. it's a, like a uh, it's, party. Yeah. Oh, totally. I'd be down. That's great. But there's a. Uh, there are a bunch of recordings uh, from uh, Toronto, uh, and it's uh, and there's sort of you go back through everything, and it's it's interesting. I mean, this is uh, apparently this is what I spend my time doing. But I found the uh, like uh, looking at the actual sort of venues where it's sort of credited as these being recorded, and then trying to figure out where these venues were because they were all these sort of like little weird like basement uh like back room sort of venues <laughs> in like downtown toronto like way back when uh -huh. and it's uh and i mean yeah they're all they're all uh demolished now with uh condos on top of them and there's barely any record of these places oh that's insane I, there's yeah. so much history there's so much history you know it's like i don't know man like and and you know to think that like Someone like Art Tatum played in a fucking, you know, basement somewhere in Toronto. I mean, you know, the guy should have been playing at Massey Hall, you know, but he was playing yeah. in some fucking basement. Yeah. I don't know, man. Crazy. Like, it's just nuts. You know, Absolutely I don't. Absolutely crazy. And then, and then people who can barely play four chords get to play at Massey Hall. I don't know. Like the, <laughs> I, I don't know. There's just, there's something absurd about that. Oh, Yeah. Absolutely.
there's also with uh, Art Tatum, I'm not, I can't, uh, you know, a hundred percent attest to the, uh, you know, accuracy of this because it's, uh, you know, I heard it secondhand, but, uh, mm. you know, I, I, I tend to spread it around. So, uh, <laughs> there's, uh, but, um, uh, cause Art Tatum was blind. Yes. And, uh, so he, you know, he apparently sort of how he got started with playing the way he did partially was he would go to, uh, he was taken to like dueling piano bars and that sort of thing. And he'd go home and he'd sort of figure everything out by ear on his own, not understanding that it was two people playing <laughs> two pianos. So it's a, <laughs> and then it's, and I don't know, I think that says something about just intention and artistry too. Just like, I'm going to make this sound. This is how I'm going to sound when I play piano. And you f figure out a way to make it happen. That's, I know. Uh, I know. It's insane. I, I mean, you, I mean, it's almost, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. I mean, and that's the thing. The human body is such a strange contraption. I mean, I mean, we can practically do anything that we imagine, you know? I, I mean, look at Leonardo da Vinci, you know? He, he was drawing flying machines in the 15th century, and, and it's like it was only realized in the, in, the, in the 20th century. But, I mean, like, I mean, it's insane. You know, like, like if you yeah. can imagine it, you can do it. And, and I, think, I think as artists, you know, we're constantly bringing something out of nothing. You know, there's that, there's that magic. You know, it's like... It doesn't exist except for in your mind, and then somehow you find a way to manifest yeah. it. Yeah. Well, maybe not uh, something out of nothing. Uh, for me, anyway, I think it's more like. Well, it's no, more we like, don't, it's we... more like alchemy, you know? You might mm. be able to make, uh, you know. Uh, gold out of lead. Gold, yeah, exactly. But, but there's something. Yes, you're right. There is. Yeah, I, I was actually wrong. It isn't, it isn't something out of nothing. That's, that's sort of a very mystical way of thinking about it, almost a Sufi way of thinking about it. But it, let's be practical. We don't live in an ahistoric vacuum. You know, we have to contend with everything that's come before. We have to deal with the scene. We have to deal with all the people that are working in, in our time period, whether we like it or not. Because these are our, our contemporaries. We don't have to call them our peers, but these are our contemporaries. These are the people that we're working with, in a way, even, even if we choose not to work with them, you know? Because uh, we're part of the scene. We're part of this tapestry, you know? You know, the, 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 the rug is not made out of one thread. You know, you have all the threads. So you're right. You're right. It is kind of like alchemy. You know, you have to take what exists and, and then transform it, mm -hmm. you know? And... Yeah, I, I don't know. I like, you know, can we transform lead into gold, or is or is that just a myth? I don't know. I mean, can we? Mm, I don't. I don't. I don't think so. But uh, it's. I don't uh, mean literally. Not, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I I think there's also um. Oh, what was it? There was there was an interview I was mm. hearing uh with um Alan Moore, mm. uh uh, maybe about a year ago. Uh, who is sort of like uh, who considers himself sort of a uh, an artist and a sort of um, I guess ritual magician in the sense of like uh, Alistair uh, Crowley sort of uh, Oliphas Levi sort of whatever, and I think it's uh, he. But I mean, you know, the more you sort of uh, listen to him and then sort of actually research sort of you know this tradition of magic it's sort of it's about uh it's about it's not it's it's not literal it's about you know uh transformation and in the sense of like his art like how how uh you can you know you know spiritually transform someone in a very serious intense uh way uh using you know a piece of art and how sort of intertwined that is conceptually with with magic and the way you can sort of you know you can uh you can forever sort of turn someone from a you know from a well-respected person to uh you know a fool 
uh, by v- through a very uh, cutting uh, satire, say. So yes. It's, yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, you're right. You're right. And 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 there there is there is something beautiful about being hoodwinked, whether it's a magic trick. Uh, whether whether it's a piece of music, whether it's a sculpture, whether it's a photograph, you know, I mean, th- there's this bar in Montreal. It's a speakeasy uh, where they have these gorgeous photographs of these gentlemen in black and white. You know, some of them smoking a cigar, some of them just sitting on a lounge chair, and and you know, when I looked at the price tag, I mean, you know, I I almost I I almost wanted to I almost wanted to break the the photograph, and then I realized, you know what? Maybe it is worth that. Maybe it is worth that because it, I mean, whoever the photographer was, he was an absolute genius. It made me angry because I couldn't afford them and I wanted one. But but at the same time, like, I mean, it was beautiful. It was absolutely, just even to get to see it was a privilege and it was a magic trick because, you know, it, it seemed like they were there with me. I could, I, it's like I could reach out and shake that person's hand, but it was a black and white mm. photograph. Yeah. And, wow. So there, there is magic. I think there is magic, and I think artists are magicians. They really are. Yeah. Especially yeah. the best ones, because yeah. because you know uh, you know you c- you can only you can only look at techniques so much. I mean, someone like Martha Argerich, you know, when you watch her play, it's like yes, she has an insane technique, but but there's more than that, you know. Because if she was just a, a brilliant technician, you wouldn't feel anything, you know. It's the it's the I don't know. It's it's how. I don't know. Like you said, it's about communication. It's how she communicates that makes it magical. Mm -hmm. It's not the fact that she can play octaves at insane speeds. It's the fact that she can do that and still, and says, and and by doing, I don't know, it's profound. It means something. Exactly. Exactly. That's where the magic is. That's where the magic is, you know? And then, and then some kid can play, I don't know, Mary Had a Little Lamb, but, but they put so much emotion and feeling into it that it's the same thing as watching Martha Argerich play, you know, Tchaikovsky. I don't know. I, I I don't know. Like I'm not comparing the two, but I'm just saying, you know, they're they're both equally valid, you know? Yeah. As expressions, yeah. as expressions of art. You know? Mm-hmm. And then you have Yoko Ono screaming into a mic for an hour, and if anybody else did that, they'd be thrown in a fucking asylum, but when she does it, she gets paid a million dollars. So, you know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Like and I don't know. Art is such a strange thing. It, it's like it's so hard to decipher what's madness and what's genius. Yeah. Yeah, there's a. Uh, oh, there. I was just uh, watching This Is Spinal Tap. Uh, Re watching it. I've seen that movie many times, but I haven't seen it for a few years. And there's a. Uh, there, <laughs> when they're talking about their album cover, it's like. Uh, it's it's such a fine line between clever and stupid. <laughs> 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 Uh, what are you drinking? Uh, tea. Oh, so am I. I'm drinking. Yeah. I'm drinking Kenyan tea. Oh, I'm I'm drinking uh, uh Loblaws tea. So. <laughs> 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 Wait, that that could be a symphony. I'm drinking Kenyan tea. I'm drinking Loblaws tea. Yeah, <laughs> it could be a, it could be a fucking symphony, and and uh, and and the whole time the the you know the the violins are gonna be just tapping away rhythmically with the you know with the wooden end of their bow because yeah. that that's the only way you could really communicate anything. <laughs> yes, bow bowing bowing violins is too easy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh. Yeah, I every now and then I think about like because uh um, it's Berlioz does that in the uh. Yeah, Colenio bowing, bowing with the wood side in the yes. Symphony Fantastique. And every now and then I think about, like, what it must have been like for a violinist in, <laughs> like, the... Uh, <laughs> back then to be told by, a, you know, Berlioz, okay, so I want you to play this with the wood of your bow. And, you know, I'm just thinking of all these people just sit, these orchestra members just sitting there sort of shaking their heads going, oh, I hate this guy. (laughs) Yes, yes. Uh, Well, well, you know, I mean, that's the thing, right? Composers are all a little bit insane. Uh, We have to be, you know. I don't know. It's weird. Like, Like, 
you know, what if what if suddenly instead of blowing the flute, you know, I don't know, you you ask the flute player to just bow the flute the whole time, you know, yeah. and 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 you know, or or just or you know, I just just play the keys of the flute but never blow into it, you know. It's like you could make the whole orchestra a a percussion ensemble, you know. I mean. You know, and and you could tell the timpani to you know play the timpani with the ebow rather than actually playing it with mallets. I don't know. I mean, you can be absolutely insane if you want to. You know, you can you can reassign the whole orchestra and 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 suddenly you know it's it's not an orchestra anymore. It's just a a bunch of kids you know in a sandbox throwing sand at each other. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very strange. Uh, yeah, because being a professional orchestra member, I mean, what does that even mean? Like when a composer asks you to. I don't know, you know, you know, to play your violin with the wood end of your bow. I mean, it's like, you know, do you take that seriously? Is that is that is that as legitimate as bowing the violin? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Uh, but 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 I would say that the fact that they're being asked to do that is interesting in and of itself. Yeah. 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 What's the weirdest thing you've done in one of your compositions? Weirdest thing I've done in one of my compositions. Yes. Uh, I don't know. There are so many different. Uh, there Oddities. are so many different definitions of weird. Yes. You know, it's, you're right. What does that even mean? Yeah, I had a uh, K. Uh, I had a chamber opera that was uh, about a based on a Philip K. Dick uh, novel. Hmm. Or not novel, a short story that was sort of, uh, it's about this sort of guy, uh, this interstellar traveler sort of uh, being in in hibernation, going to sort of a colony world. It's sort of like this classic science fiction sort of thing. But the story takes place uh, entirely in his head because it's been, uh, he's been put into an imperfect state of hibernation by the sort of artificial intelligence computer so his body is basically <laughs> disabled uh and his but his mind is awake and he's in a dialogue with the uh ship's onboard computer which is trying to keep him uh sane throughout the sort of like tens or hundreds or however many years he's going to be in this state of mental you know unwanted mental activity this is uh, brilliant. Uh, this uh, this is this is Philip K. Dick, but I had a uh, so I the weird thing uh, that I was gonna say I had part of the opera where he's um, well at the beginning there's this sort of like swelling like sort of gesture uh, that the ensemble does that's uh, I thought it was pretty distinctive, mm. and then I had. So I recorded the ensemble playing the beginning of the piece. And then when within the context of there's a there's a part where he's uh, he's in this sort of um, he's he's in this sort of uh, like dream state simulation thing that the computers put him in. So he thinks he's living his life, but then he's pulled out of it after realizing it's fake and he sort of develops complex about this but it's like uh but the uh the way he realizes it's fake in my opera was i had a a little radio on stage on a table and the radio s he's doing his stuff and the radio starts playing the beginning of the opera again through this tinny little speaker on stage and it sort of creates this like existential crisis for him. So I, I that's that's a weird thing that. I've done is create oh. like this sort of meta recording and playback of the thing itself as a plot device within an opera. That oh, was sort of unusual. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And and how did you like cue it? Did you did you have like a foot pedal? Did you did you just? No, I had a uh, so I cued it. I was operating a computer, but it was uh, what I had done was I bought one of those little like FM transmitters that people use to play uh, to like play their music in their cars. Yes, and I, yes, I know. Yeah, that. so I like was transmitting to like this clock radio through that. 
<laughs> That's brilliant. That's amazing. <laughs> That's so cool. I wish I'd been there for that. That that sounds that sounds wonderful. Oh, you know? And and now thank you. now imagine imagine you took this one step further and you know uh, and and you 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 had you know radios throughout the hall and and then you just triggered all of them you know at random points you know in the middle of an orchestra's performance as a way to I don't know as some sort of prank you know you just have hundreds of speakers placed throughout the hall and then you you know you you know you record bits of the orchestra and start playing it back while they're performing. Yeah, there are a few. Uh, I think. I know there are, there are some co composers I've uh, I've met personally I know or uh, who who have done similar things or who have like everyone in the audience is uh, has their own set of headphones that they hear things through and I know uh, I think James O'Callaghan did or will do that I I'm not sure which and uh, there was another guy. Uh, 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 someone else I met a while ago who was uh, doing, he was using like uh, sort of the equivalent, you know, the inverse uh, idea of like a contact mic. So like a contact amplifier to create sort of like almost like singing pies as speakers <laughs> that were sort of placed throughout an audience. But <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, well, and you know, I've always thought it'd be interesting if plants were conductors. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, there was, there was uh, at the University of Manitoba when I was there. There was a uh, Gordon Fitzell did something using uh, with like singing plants at one point <laughs> using a similar technology as the pie thing. Uh, yeah. For. Uh, a Shea performance, which is the uh, their experimental improv ensemble of which I was a member for a couple years, and it's uh, yeah, I just I only I wasn't actually there for the performance, but I know they did this because I was one of the people who sort of uh, was cleaning out the Shea storage area near the end of my uh, you know time at the University of Manitoba, and uh, came across all these uh these plants with uh these planters with cords coming out of them so <laughs> <laughs> ah wow yes well you know it's fascinating when you look at cymatics and you realize literally everything is music you know uh i mean you know a duck paddling in a pond and making those ripples that's a composition you know uh, a stone dropping you know uh into water that's a composition you know uh, a coconut falling from a tree is a composition. I mean, it's, I mean, you can push, I mean, you can push the ontological music limits of music very, very far. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, you, you can get pretty insane with it all. You know, you could look at the, the pattern of sand dunes and consider that a composition, hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and it is, it actually is when you think about it because it's all vibrations. I mean, everything's vibrating. You know, yeah. everything's always vibrating. I mean, that, if you look at quantum physics, everything's always vibrating. Oh, totally. And the point at which, you know, sound becomes uh, light on and that and where sound becomes uh, just, you know, a pitch becomes a rhythm. It's sort of uh, I don't know. There's yeah, there. Are... It's very strange. And, and and and, you know, you can even taste sound. Yeah. You know, it's insane. like the way that the brain works is so fascinating. I mean, like, yeah. Oh, and what were we talking about? Oh, we were talking about dogs earlier, and then we yes. were talking about uh, other the way other animals perceive things. And I mean, I I was just gonna point out like it's such a it's such a strange thing, sort of how we, you know, this perceptual box that human beings are in. We have this very specific uh, method of perceiving everything, and this very specific type of consciousness for the most part and it's uh yeah i mean there's so much uh i mean it's it would be it would be an entirely different uh deal writing a piece for like turtles birds. or something yeah. exactly yeah birds or turtles yeah exactly i mean it's and and you know uh, we we seem to think of ourselves as having a superior level of understanding or intellect to animals but i mean you listen oh we do listen. but we're we're very limited 
Yes, I know, I know, and that's the thing, right? But but what do we judge? I mean, what's the scale? What's the measurement of intelligence? You know, I mean, you look at the way the dolphins interact with each other, and it's like, I mean, it's 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 almost human. You know, the way that they talk to each other, the the languages that they have, the way that they sing. I mean, there's dolphin choirs for fuck's sake. And that's the uh, that's the questioning thing. It's just uh, you you don't judge. You just sort of. Uh... You just, just question. sort of let it be, and you question, and you wonder. Yes. Yes, a perpetual state of wonder. I think, I think that's what distinguishes truly interesting thinkers from the mediocre ones. You know, the fact that you, you just know how much you don't know, and that you're always wondering, that you're always curious, you know? It's like, because yeah. when, you, when, you you, when you think you know it all, when you think you're finished, you might as well be dead, you know? That's the end. Because, you know... It's like you have to, I don't know, if you're not asking questions, then what are you doing that's worth a damn? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Humor, humor and music. Victor Borga. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, they, people ask whether, whether classical music has any, any humor, and I always refer them to Victor Borga because that, yeah. that guy proved it better than anyone else. Well, at least yeah. as far as I've seen. I mean, he did the stranger things, you know, like he had an opera singer, you know, and he kept telling her not to touch the piano. And every time he, she touched the piano, he would, you know, fly into a fit of rage. Yeah, there is like there is also there's a lot of contemporary music that uh, that's you know, incredibly funny. That's meant to be that's laughed at. that's really funny. And people take it way too seriously. <laughs> Like I, yes, I will. You know, you know that that yeah, violin there. You have to so, sit here and, yes, and you know, be silent. It. And, yeah, and that's right. And twiddle your mustache in just yeah. just the right way, and and politely sip yeah. sip your brandy. You're not allowed to make any noise. You're not allowed to clap yeah. in between movements. It's the whole yeah. thing is. I mean, it's bizarre. It and is bizarre. I mean, I also I I'm I'm fully. Uh, convinced that one can also respect something and find it funny yes but it's, uh... yes you're right <laughs> you're right yes i mean laughing at it is not disrespectful i mean laughing at it is honoring it i mean yeah, the fact that it elicits it's, that it's response engaging with it in yes. the way that's natural to you that's and I right i mean yeah i mean i used to I mean, when I was in Winnipeg, I used to go to a lot of the uh, a lot of new music concerts uh, and just sort of like and sort of, you know, snicker to myself like this is this is very funny. And <laughs> and, uh, and and I think that's OK. That doesn't say anything bad about the piece. Yes, it's not anything less. It's not it's not it's not any less because it elicited that response. You know, even if it's an unintentional response, even if the composer didn't intend for it to be funny. I mean, yeah. I mean. I mean, being funny is actually a gift, I would say, you know, I mean, and, and I don't know, you're right, like, like, I don't understand why people think that, that, that by laughing or by humoring something, you're actually disrespecting it, because, because I, you know, it's a form of appreciation, I would argue, you know, yeah. just, just as much as clapping is a form of appreciation, and then, and then, you know, in the 19th and 20th century, people are, you know, saying, oh, you can't clap in between movements, because that's disrespectful to the composer. Who, well, who made that rule? Yeah. You know, it's like, why shouldn't you clap? You know, it's nobody's going to tell you at a rock concert, you know, don't don't, you know, scream and yell in the mosh pit, you know? Yeah. So so why or why can't we why can't we have a mosh pit at, at the, you know, at, at Roy Thompson Hall or at the OSM? Yeah, I mean, a classical yeah. mosh pit, you know, why not? <laughs> I, why, yeah. why can't we all headbang to Wagner or Berlioz if we want, you know, <laughs> yeah. why not? Like, I'm not kidding. Like, you know, no, let's, let's no, just totally. like, let's, let's go nuts. Let's, let's be on LSD and, you know, and let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's be tripping our balls off as, 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 you know, as, as something is being performed yeah. and like wave our hands around and, and, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I think that's one thing actually I really appreciated about, uh, about the music the music appreciation culture in Winnipeg huh. when I was there it's you know I knew a bunch of people who just sort of you know I think first of all people go actually go to the symphony and care about new music like regular people not not like just sort of you know academics the weird, yeah not academics not the sort of you know weird people who usually go to this stuff it's like uh <laughs> It's, you know, the just normal people, you know, you're walking down the street and, you know, you know, people can tell you something about the orchestra in their city. And it's uh, that's amazing. It is. But I mean, I, I 
no knew a number of people who would you know go to you know go and there's uh and you know specific you know specifically a couple people who would go and and get like super high uh right before going into the concert hall and just go and listen to like Mahler and it's just you know come back out it's like that was a trip and <laughs> it's uh it's you know it's 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 a way to be <laughs> exactly exactly yeah it is it is and and you know it's interesting too because if there was n if there were no rules and there were no boundaries we'd have nothing to push against yeah. So the fact that they exist is actually ironically a blessing in disguise. Yeah, it's helpful and uh, and simultaneously infuriating. So. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. The best things are. Yeah. Yes, the best things are. They they're very helpful and 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 at the same time infuriating. Like academia, you know. Like I, you know, yeah. I wouldn't want to dispense of academia, but the fact that it exists is a fucking nightmare, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's no, like it's like being called an being called, you know, an academic. I, I don't know if that's I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult. Well, it's very sort of I think academia is I mean, there are so many great things and there are so many fantastic pursuits. Yes. But it's also very, you know, there is a very sort of myopic sort of sequestered viewpoint i think that's often yes it's you very can insular. often as associate with it yeah it's very insular and it's also uh just you know it's very self-congratulating that's some right level. yeah yes yes it is yes it is and i find that sickening uh and it's like you know you listen to you listen to the students of olivier latry and they all sound like him and that's not the point. That's not the point of being a teacher. The point is to uh, give them their own voice, to to show, to be a mirror, to show them what they can do. Uh, you know, it's don't I don't you know, the, the, I, I think the greatest teachers, you know, the greatest teachers just show you yourself. Yeah. You know, and I think it's also. Uh, yeah, I mean, for and that's me, why I liked working with Simon. Oh, Simon's great. I mean, he's very. He's very open about the fact that, you know, it's not for it's not for me to judge what uh, what you want to say. It's how effectively are you saying it? That's right. And that's and that's that's the way to be a good mentor, in my opinion. You know, it's uh, yes, it's not about and I think uh, that applies to other, you know, art as well i mean it's not if i were uh you know mentoring a painter it's uh you know i might give tips on how to do it if i was going to be open-minded but it's not up to me i don't think to judge like whether you want to paint a dolphin or not that's it's right. like yeah <laughs> yeah I, I mean look at look at someone like pierre soulanger you know the french painter uh who only who paints exclusively in black and and says that what he's doing is, is he's painting with light that, that, that the whole point is is not the fact that the canvases are black. It's how the light interacts with the black on the canvas. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's kind of that's kind of a mind fuck. But at the same time, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. You know, and 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 I don't know. I mean, I mean, you just you just have to honor the artist's intention, you know? Yeah. And 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 I don't know, like like you said, you know, I mean, you're not a painter, but but if you were to tell someone, you know, here's what I think you should do, and they they value what you're saying and they do it, then that's great. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. I mean, you don't have to be a painter to mentor a painter, is what I'm saying, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, and and that's what I like about Simone. It was like he he didn't claim to be an authority. He didn't claim to be you know a master. He just claimed to be, I don't know, a, a, just another composer. He was like one of the gang, you know. Yeah. No, it's like here's what I think you're trying to do, and uh, you know here here are my thoughts on it. And That's I mean, exactly if you're right. not, if you don't, I mean, if you didn't agree with here's them, it why wasn't a I problem. think they're important. And yeah, if you if you disagree, then that's fine. That's <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly. And we did that Kadar Veski, the the exquisite corpse composition. Yeah. There, yeah, that was that was cool. I was just gonna, I was just thinking. There's a composer I know from uh, Calgary who I sort of uh, started out, um, you know, talking to about composition before I went to, uh, I did my undergrad, and he had a 
uh, a hard time, I think, with uh, composition teachers. And uh, and, uh, when he went to university, and I remember I asked him... uh, I asked him what he thought of something, uh, score, and he said uh, uh, something along the lines of, like, I'm not going to comment on your work because uh, then I'd be no better than so-and-so. And it's sort of, it's, I don't know, I think on s- it's unfortunate when somebody gets, it's, it's sad, I think, when academia sort of uh, creates that sort of thing. Yes. When it squashes people instead of raising them up. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and and I think being critical, you know, you can be tactful. There's ways to do it. There's just some people that are too brutal, and then they, and then you know, I I don't know. I've had I've had terrible teachers. I've had I've had terrible people yeah. in my life, musically well, speaking. I even had somebody yeah. say that I would amount to nothing. Uh, a a person that that you know he, he basically said how dare how dare you you decide not to work with a teacher you know you have to consult your father and you have to consult me and and the fact that you just walked away means that you will ac- amount to nothing he actually said yeah. that you know well and- yeah well i remember uh there have been a number of times you know when that's happened to me one of the uh earliest i can think of related to music was i was in a band i was in a i played clarinet uh in the uh beginner band at westmount charter school in grade five and i was uh you know i was uh uh told that i was the uh the uh worst clarinet player to ever come through the band and it's uh sort of in a public way in front of people and it was uh you should have taken a bow yeah (laughs) i mean that's i'm you know, just, uh, I, I just have just enough of a fuck you attitude to probably do that, but, uh, (laughs) I didn't. And, uh, but I mean, even, you know, up until recently, I mean, there are people who just don't get it sometimes. I mean, I got a, uh, I got another, uh, you know, adjudication of, uh, and, uh, of, of my work for something that, uh, that called my music naive and crude. And it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it just, it happens. It happens. And it's, uh, uh well, you know, they call, they called, uh, Thelonious Monk, the elephant in the room of keyboard players. Yeah. Some, a critic said he was the elephant in the room. Uh, and, yeah. and then, and then of course, you know, I think it was a few years later that he was, you know, named, uh, he was on the cover of time magazine. And then suddenly he went from being, you know, someone that only the jazz cognoscenti knew about to, you know, to being just immensely famous and well-respected and everybody wanted to play with him. Even the idiots yeah. that were, you know, dissing his compositions and, and you know, calling his approach screwed and, and, and stupid even, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know, man. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe maybe you'll be on the cover of Time magazine and then you can say to whoever adjudicated your, whoever reviewed your music as being naive and crude and saying, hey, I was on Time's mag- uh, Time magazine. Where's your portrait? <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, like, cause, cause sometimes these people, these critics who, who claim to know what's what, you know, well, well, what makes them the best judge of that? You know, what makes them the authority and why, why should their opinion matter? You know, they're, they've decided they're the authorities. That's, that's right. That's, that's the that's whole fucking the point. That's and the it, fucking point. That's the, it's it comes... the same thing with the monarchy. You know, they yeah. decided they were important. They decided I am above you. You know, I'm the queen. Therefore, you must, you know, I you you must pay me taxes, you know, and everything should be in my name. She's just a, she's just a fucking white lady. Why why should I care? Why should I what gives her power? Her crown? I can make a fucking crown and wear it around. Mm. I'll make it out of paper mache and prance around and hold a scepter, the royal scepter, and 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 tell people to pay me taxes. Does that make me mo- uh, royalty? Am I am I suddenly monarchy? You know, are are they going to call me the king, or am I just going to be a king in my own head? You know, I mean, the whole thing is a fucking sham. Why, why should they? Yeah. Why should? They, yes, you're right. They claim to be the authorities. They. It's a. It, that's the point. That's the fucking point. They decided they were the authorities. So yeah. I can. You can content. You can. You can disagree that's the beauty of it you can disagree you can say no you can say no i don't think what you're saying matters you can have a different opinion and that's where your power comes from and and i think and i think like that's that's what a lot of marginalized people have been doing to reclaim their power they've just been saying 
you know, because power is either surrendered or taken by force. Those are the only two options. Hmm. And that's what I've come to realize. And it's the same thing with music. You know, you can either take it by force or you can just you wait for the person to surrender or to die. And yeah, yeah. and I'm not advocating I mean, violence, by the way. I'm just saying, you know what no, I mean? It's, no, but I think it, I mean, there are definitely, you know, there are people who have, I think, built themselves into these sort of uh i don't know almost like ego trap type things where they you know they think you know i'm doing something i i you know it has to be important because i need to be important and then it's uh other people who are doing something different are not important because i'm important and i'm doing important things and they can't you know and I mean, the reality is, you know, it's just, it's, we're all fine to, you know, coexist. Your art can be cool, my art can be cool, and they can be entirely dissimilar. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Yes, there's space for all of us. But, but unfortunately, the way, that the, the way that the industry works, the way that the market works, it claims that there's only so much space and that, that everybody, you know, it's like a pie. You know, it's like there's, there's, all much, there's only so much pie to go around. But, you know, I mean, it's like money. It's fiction. You can just make another pie. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know? And I know that sounds insane, but, like, at the same time, like, it's also totally practical. I mean, they say there's not enough to go around, but but who decided that, you know? Like, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, you and I don't don't have recording contracts with, with Sony or D D Deutsch Gramophone, you know? But does that make us any less worthy as artists than i don't know the new york phil or cameron carpenter or i don't know whoever else actually does have a recording contract i don't think yeah. so you know yeah. i would say our art is equally valid equally legitimate maybe even more legitimate because we have to struggle much harder in a way to even be heard or to be recognized yeah I. it's you know? just uh i don't know for and me, i'm not yeah, i'm not trying to diss uh, anyone i think it comes it comes back to it about uh about communication and ultimately just saying what you need what to you say. Mean. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Say what you mean. That's yeah. an incredibly important thing, being direct. Yes, not beating around the bush. And people will yeah. people will get upset at you for being blunt, but I, 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 I think there's no other way as an artist. And I mean, just... you can be kind and direct, but yes, being direct is important. It is. In a lot of aspects of life. It is. It really is. And it's not easy to do. It's not easy to do. It's not easy to be direct. Because, no. you know, being direct does have consequences. You can lose friends. You can lose patrons. You can lose, you, can, you, you know, you can alienate people by being direct. Because yeah. especially in our society, and well, and I say our, I mean Canadian society, you know, being direct is, is almost, un, yeah, I mean, it's not, it, it's, not like we're, it's not like we're all Dutch or Swedish, you know? It's not like we, being blunt is part of our culture. It's not. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. I think I, I was going to say something, and I, uh, I, my train of thought got derailed again. That happens, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> regularly. I, I'm sorry. But, but, I mean, you know, it's fascinating, all these meandering turns we're taking, you know? Uh, you know, it's like, yeah. I mean, the train can go wherever you lay down the tracks, really. Yeah, it's 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 great. I mean, this has been a a great interview, and it's sort of a uh, there's there's a uh, poem I've been setting recently by mm. uh, uh, as part of a uh, a sort of mentorship, uh, you know. Um, or ex choral experimentation thing I've been doing with the Amadeus Choir. Mm. And uh, I've been working uh, with this uh, other poet recently, and I sort of, like, power wrote this, uh, this like, 10-minute uh, choral piece uh, over the past three weeks. And it's... Uh, uh, the But the poem itself just sort of... Uh, it really sort of struck me and it sort of it took a but it was just you know because it goes everywhere it's has you know 
stuff that's like sort of sound effects it's got like you know wordplay and weird rhyming stuff and variable sort of you know variable sort of structures and like uh but it's like it's you know a very very maximalist poem but it's all it's meaningful and it's incredibly natural and it just follows you know these intuitive thought patterns in the in this very very interesting and sort of meaningful way and it's been a yeah just i think art often and you know life is best when you just sort of let it be what it wants to be well i would like to think of this as our uh our virtual tea ceremony <laughs> you know with 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 uh japanese calligraphy you know on imaginary yeah. scrolls behind us <laughs> yeah with in our a, uh in a garden and blah blah's tea that's right yes yes that's right I've got to show you some of my poetry, actually. I, I don't think I've ever shown you any of my poetry. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see your poetry. Yeah. Well, I've heard some of your poetry because you you sang it, you know. <laughs> in, and I believe in one piece that, that you, that, you know, um, that y you just were randomly talking with the band, and that, that was part of the piece. Yeah. It was brilliant. Yeah. It was brilliant. I no, mean, it was thank like... Thank you. Yeah. No, I mean, it was poetry, but it was like, it was, it was so... I mean, it was so mundane and so technical that it was like, I don't know. It was, it was, it was brilliant. It was brilliant because like nobody wants to listen to that stuff, and you made it interesting to listen to. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 it's interesting because your name is very similar to Frank Zappa's name, and so, mm -hmm. you know, so you know when I tell people I I listen to a Zappa piece, they're like Zappa. I said no 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 Zappa, you know. Yeah. You can definitely a... you can milk that. Oh yeah, I uh, yeah. There's uh, I there have been a number of people who you know mishear my last name and go, oh, are you related to Frank? And I'm like, no, different last name. You misheard. I my <laughs> standard response is like, uh, no, but I've met his nephew, uh, which, <laughs> <laughs> which is true, but <laughs> that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's that's funny that's funny uh how's your clavinet doing oh the uh the clavichord it's a clavichord uh, yes yeah, not clavinet yeah clavichord. it's yeah it's uh i don't know it's 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 okay it's seen better days i've had it sort of uh it's i it <laughs> hasn't been like fully strung for, i've got all the strings loosened right now because it's back in the uh my recording studio which is sort of uh which has sort of been left uh sort of un uh you know uninhabited largely sort of uninhabited for the through the course of the pandemic but right it's, uh yeah it's it's a fun instrument though yeah it's very fun uh and also very quiet but i love that about and yeah. you can actually you can make you can you can bend the notes by by you can yeah which is brilliant like i I mean that's such a fast. I mean that's that's like that's that's the coolest aftertouch ever. Yeah, and for like a you know period sort of baroque instrument, it's like wow, why don't why didn't we continue making this louder? <laughs> 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 yes, exactly. And, and and you know, I mean, you know about the the Honer uh, whammy clavinet. Have you ever heard of that instrument? <laughs> It's it's a clavinet. Have, yeah. it's, a, it's a clavinet. It's got a, a like pickups, like an electric guitar, and it's got a whammy bar. And you can actually like, there's a guy, there's a guy who plays th this this whammy clavinet. Stevie Wonder plays this uh, whammy clavinet. There's very few of them in existence, less than a hundred, I think. And and of yeah. course, Stevie Wonder owns one. And I mean, I've always wanted to get my hands on one of those, because man, yeah. like as a keyboard player, you just you never look as cool as a guitar player, except when you have a whammy, <laughs> except when you have a whammy clavinet. Cause then, <laughs> then, then it's like you've outcooled the guitar player. I mean, just the guitar player can't even compete with how cool you look, you know. Cause it's like it's a massive whammy bar. It's like a, it's like it's like it's it's like four foot long. It's like a massive whammy bar, you know. 
And it's like you're pressing the whammy bar, and I don't know, it's squealing away like a guitar with like feedback emanating from all the speakers. I mean, that's I mean, if if that isn't cool, I don't know what is. Yeah, it's uh, there are so many cool and obscure instruments that uh, you know, we don't have access to in yes. this world, and it's uh, it's so sad. Yeah, I was uh. Yeah, I thought for a while I was going to be spending a term abroad at the uh, Sibelius Academy mm. in uh, Helsinki, and I was very, uh, I was very excited about the fact that they have a uh, a microtonal grand piano oh. uh, at the Sibelius Academy, which I was, I was thinking, man, gotta give her a go, and uh, <laughs> I never got that chance. Ah, <laughs> uh, never say never. You still might. <laughs> Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, and and uh, and and uh, well, I'm very happy that we had a tea ceremony today. Yeah, no, this is this has been really great, Afraz. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, it's been a pleasure. Well, pleasure's mine. Take care. You too.